Hello everyone, it's Oliver here and I'm back with a new audio commentary. Rob Hill, aka The Bad Movie Bible, is joining me again to discuss the 1985 Canon Films classic, American Ninja. How you doing, Rob? All very well, thank you. Good man, good man. So you got all your notes prepared for American Ninja? Always, always. <laughs> I just got to do it off memory and see if I get it right. <laughs> Okay, folks, you can enjoy this podcast by itself, but if you wish to sync it with your own copy of the film, put the timestamp to zero and press play now. I never saw American Ninja as a kid. I saw it on the video store shelves. I think mostly number two, where he's got like Dudikoff, is, like, his face is like covering up the whole picture. And he's got at the bottom a picture of him as a ninja. But. Uh, but they were 18 rated, and I always thought they were like, you know, stupidly violent kind of movies. And when I did eventually see them, I was like, they're a bit, bit camp and cheesy. And yeah. not really that bloody and violent. They've got a lot of fighting in it. But the tone of it is not like overly serious. It's very much kind of, you know, a bit, yeah, a bit cheesy in camp and a bit, bit light hearted, you know, approach to it with its tone. Um, I think it's kind of in keeping with Canon's kind of style of output. You know, I thought, well... Let- it might even be that that led to the 18 certificate, because James Furman, who oversaw everything we were allowed to watch as children in this country, had a real problem, I believe, with um, light-hearted action, essentially. Yeah, so uh, maybe that's why, because like you say, there's no real content that means this is an adult movie. Oh, God, no. I mean, it's, it's, the BBFC obviously had... The- obviously had an issue with the word ninja, didn't they? I think for a period of time. Obviously that sort of affected the turtles and they became hero turtles. But in 85, I, you know, this was called American Warrior in the UK. Um, I think in some other countries it was called American Fighter. But uh, I, what I always found amusing about this film was um, we're seeing ninjas in broad daylight <laughs> where the outfits they're wearing. It's, it's all, it all stands back to Enter the Ninja, Revenge of the Ninja, Ninja 3, where you've got guys in ninja outfits in broad daylight where the, the idea of the outfits is, is camouflage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I can see. <laughs> like you're, they're like different coloured ones as well, don't they? I think in Ninja 3, isn't there like a pink one? Yeah, n- well, ninja, n- well, Ninja 3, famously, the, the black ninja actually wears a green outfit. But... It, <laughs> <laughs> which, which coincidentally is um, actually the exact outfit that Chuck Norris wears in that famous uh, promo still promoting this movie, which obviously yes. he, he never ended up appearing in. But that famous still of him doing a flying kick, he's wearing the, the Green Black Ninja's costume from Ninja 3 The Domination. That's right, because obviously before this film was made, they were, Canon were famously had the pile of scripts for Chuck Norris and the pile of scripts for Charles Bronson. And they'll see that Chuck Norris was, you know, asked to do, asked to play the lead in this film, and didn't have, and Sam Furstenberg, though he didn't know the ins and outs of why Chuck decided not to do it, he, what he was told was that Chuck didn't want to have his face covered up with a ninja mask. But I suppose ultimately, when you watch the film, Michael Dudikoff only wears the ninja outfit for ten minutes exactly. at the end of the film. Exactly. So it, that for me, that explanation has never quite rung true. For that reason, but obviously it's not—it's not a huge crime in the annals of cinematic history. We'll leave that one. But then I read something uh, recently, actually. I can't remember where now. Um, I'll tell you what it was. It was the—the the, I don't think it's in the book series that he wrote on canon movies, but the chap who wrote that extraordinary three-part book series. I've, oh yes, yeah, it's, I've got, it's Austin. Austin Trun- that's it it. Trunnick. That's it. That's it. I, I read him an interview with him somewhere saying. Um, Actually, Norris never was attached to this movie. What happened was uh, Menachem Golan, uh, the the creative head of canon, came up with the idea of the title American Ninja. Loved the idea of of that title. Handed it to um, a a writer, James Bruner, I think it was, I think his name is, who wrote um, a few of Chuck's movies. He then wrote what what was essentially Invasion USA under the title American Ninja. Oh. Menachem then read the script, loved it, but said, well, we can't call it American Ninja because, you know, there's not enough ninja stuff in it. Chuck's not actually a ninja. He doesn't do ninja stuff. So they basically said, OK, we'll call this Invasion USA. Chuck will star in it and we'll give the title American Ninja to Sam Furstenberg to come up with 
a plot for. He came up with a screenplay for. Right. So in in a way, Chuck wasn't actually attached to this movie. It was a different movie of the same, with the same title that then became Invasion USA. Right. Okay. Well, that that definitely makes a lot more sense because it, it needs to be a little bit more meat to that. Not you know, sort of Chuck was saying, "I'm not going to wear a mask." Exactly. You know I mean? Yeah. And, and I think actually more than anything, he was trying to. Chuck was trying because, like you say, he's only, he only wears the mask in the last scene for a few minutes. But at the t- if you look at the movies Chuck Norris was making at the time, they were all cop and army movies, yeah, not martial arts movies. I don't know this is a, it's an army movie too, but it's you know it's it's all based around ninjas. They are the antagonists. So I think he was trying to get away from trying to disassociate himself from just being a martial arts actor. Mm. It makes sense. Was well, it obviously all shot in the uh, Philippines? It's obviously a lot cheaper for them. But I think they look. They said. Uh, Sam Furstenberg said a lot of the crew had come over who had, um, had worked on Apocalypse Now. Mm. So they all sort of trained by that point. So they're very sort of very good at what they were doing. And the, the crew was massive, like 300 yeah. people working on the movie. And it's like each each person had an assistant, hence why there's yeah. so many people. And uh, Dudikoff is like, apparently throughout most of it, he's got malaria. Yes, he's like I read that. like sweating buckets, you know. I think there's more. It's, apparently, it's quite obvious when he's fighting Steve James for the first time. You know, when everyone sort of surrounds them and they have that bit of a scuffle. Yeah. Um, Dudikoff doesn't look well. It's, it's interesting. It must have been a, a difficult shoot, by all accounts. I mean, I, I, I think it was more relaxed than a lot of them are with Canon because they had a reasonable time frame and so on. But yeah, it, it can't be easy if you've got. I know that there was some tension with the with the lead actress, and yeah, Dudikoff was ill. It, it sounds like a bit of a struggle. Yeah, yeah. This I, I I did see this as a kid. It wasn't one I, I rewatched over and over again, but I saw it a couple of times. And this opening scene I thought was just fantastic. And I still watching it again recently. Actually, from the, the ninjas arrive in a minute, don't they? From the moment the ninjas turn up. There's a, like a, a two-minute action sequence that I think is just fabulous. There's, um, there's a couple of shots in the trailer which they don't use in the film, like when the ninjas they'll see springboard over something to, as they enter, but they, they use a different angle. But in the trailer, it's actually a better shot, I thought. But um, so, so Tudikov is kind of playing, isn't it, this kind of um, what was it? It's kind of a, a hero that isn't really he's not motivated to save the day. He's just kind of like. Um, what would you call it? A word where it's a... Uh, He's a reluctant hero, I guess. Reluctant hero, yeah. Um, so he doesn't... Really, yeah, he wants to do his own thing and, and he just kind of... Uh, it's, I suppose, a traditional sort of... Uh, somewhat of a superhero, isn't he? Because he, he he wears the ninja outfit at the end as a sort of costume, it feels like. Yeah, I think... Yeah, the, the, it's, it's that... It's, I've always thought that the, the key defining factor of what makes someone a superhero isn't so much that they have superpowers, it's that they have an alter ego. They need two personas to be a genuine superhero. And it's like he's spent, he spends the whole movie trying not to be one thing and then eventually embraces his true nature. You know, it's one of these quite... For, for canon, it's quite grandiose. And if I'm honest, <laughs> that's been done better. But it, it, it does work, I think. It does work. You've got... Dudikoff is an actor. You know, he's not a... An action hero, full stop. Well, he, he wasn't, yeah, because he wasn't trained in martial arts. He was a dancer and uh, I think just studied mime. But he was, uh, he, was like, he was in comedy films like The Bachelor, wasn't he? Uh, and did is it Radioactive Dreams, that Albert Pyun movie, yeah. which I still haven't seen. I don't think it's been re-released. I think there's like a, I think all you can get it on is Laserdisc, you know, uh, maybe it's some sort of bootleg DVD. But it's never. I suppose any, I'm surprised none of the boutique labels we see at the moment have picked it up. Not yet, anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I mean, you could, I think he he is presented differently. I mean, the, the fact that he's not a martial artist is a bit of a is a bit of an issue at times because he isn't that great at the fighting stuff. You know, well, at least he's not that um, elaborate or that impressive in, yeah. in the fights. He, he's good at the physical things, but yeah, he's more about um, sort of. He'll do a move and then like just pose afterwards. Like yeah. he's, you know, he throws someone and then does does his little oh, pose. That, you know? that's yeah, that's the Steve James scuffle you mentioned a minute ago. I, I I thought that was the coolest thing in the world as a kid. I used to love that. <laughs> <laughs> he does one of those in the sequel too. Actually, it was obviously his signature move. Oh, definitely. 
Now, the main ninja dude, the main villain, um, he's, he's on the Octagon. He is, Tanashi Yamashita, yeah. He's a, he was a legend in these early days of the ninja movies. He, I don't know what happened to him. He never really... He never became a big star, but he was so well respected and thought of by the community, by the martial arts community at the time. Because the fight choreography of this movie becomes like the main ninja villain in number two, right? Yeah. St- well, uh, yeah. You've well. So yeah, that's Mike Stone, who <laughs> was a hugely accomplished. Um, karate exponent in the States, multiple world champion and all, all that kind of thing, and had a really interesting life as well. He had an affair with Elvis Presley. He basically broke up Elvis Presley's marriage. Um, I think I think I'm right in saying that was him. I get There's a couple of them I get confused sometimes, but I think it was Mike Stone. Because um, you know, he, he was uh, Priscilla Presley's um, karate instructor. Um, but yeah, he, so he's, he's credited as fight choreographer in this movie, but I'm not sure what he, what he did, because I know, I know most of it was um, choreographed by Steve Lambert, who's the stunt coordinator on yeah. loads of canon movies and most of Sam Furstenberg's movies, the, certainly the American Ninja sequel, all the Ninja, you know, Revenge of the Ninja and Ninja 3 The Domination. The stunts in this are absolutely bonkers. You're like, Steve... Steve's like he's, he's willing to kill himself like, every take. Yeah, it's you know? Steve, yeah. If you've ever watched a commentary of, of Steve, with Steve Lambert, it's basically just him saying, "Yep, yeah, that's me. I did that. That was me there. Yeah, no, I doubled for him there. It's just an hour and a half of the Steve Lambert show." <laughs> and fair enough, man. You know, fair enough. It, it must be amazing to watch all this stuff and know that's you. Because the main, obviously, the main sort of female lead. I forgot her name. Now. She was some weird science on Friday the Thirteenth Part Four. She didn't have a stunt double, so Steve just put on a wig, you know, and pretended to be her. It's like, because I'm your double, you know. It's crazy. Steve James didn't have a stunt double either, simply because they they couldn't find anyone in the Philippines who looked like Steve James. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Apparently Steve James couldn't swim, though. Oh, really? That's right. Come the sequel, he had to, they had to dive off into the water, and he, at the last second he... He admitted he couldn't swim, and then they got the stunt man, the stunt double for him, and he couldn't swim. <laughs> so Michael was like, "Don't worry, I'll save you." You know, they jump in. And this is a a real. Um, this is the kind of sequence that they just that they kind of left behind canon, in, in certainly in their ninja movies. There's a whole big chunk of this, which is kind of like, a, or it's almost Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, or um, Romancing the Stone, one of those yes. adventures where you've got. A no-nonsense hero who's kind of been lumbered with this half-wit, wittering female character, and there's obvious um, tension, but there's obvious chemistry as well. And th- this whole sequence, I, I w- rewatching it recently, I couldn't believe how long it goes on for, how long they let it play out before they thinking do, we need yeah. we need more fighting quick. Yeah, because they, they then they then jump into the water and sort of. Both of them managed to hold their breath for a long time to avoid capture, <laughs> and they sort of pop up somewhere else and escape, you know. But, he, but Michael Dudikoff has not had any lines yet, mm. and when he does talk, you're like, "Is that his voice?" Yeah, it's, it's you know? always a surprise, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> He's a very soft kind of like voice, you know, and a very sort of a, I don't know, like a teenager or something at the time. Is yeah, he, are you going with that? <laughs> It's, it's fairly, it's fairly high pitched. I think is the, the <laughs> it's, yeah, it's not what you expect from a guy who looks like that. No, you don't. You want you kind of like a, I don't know, sort of a bit more manly, a bit more rugged voice. You know, like he's been chain smoking twenty marbles a day. <laughs> you know, but he's probably like at this point just really ill. Just like, yeah. <laughs> Valerius taken over. I think he, he just said he was taking like pills to combat it. Don't you usually get like a jab? You know, Injection. certainly back then you used to, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> just chew these sweets, you know. Don't make you feel better. We may have caught it going in that water, I suppose. Yeah, God, all wearing black in the Philippines. God, you'd be roasted. And they just don't look highly trained elite types, do they? The way they move is never quite right in canon mo- in canon ninja movies. Oh no, they're all just like random extras who are just like. You know, probably work at like convenience stores or something. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Do you want to be a ninja? At least they've got matching suits in in this movie. 
They do. I do love the look of the suit though in this. The, the, the sort of the padding they've got and, and and just the way when Dudikoff puts it on, it's a very sort of well costume designed look to him, and it kind of it fits him really well. It doesn't feel like a like a hand me down they've given him. They've actually designed it for him. But yeah, that money shot when he finally appears at the end in the costume is absolutely oh. brilliant. Oh, it's great. It's just a shame he clearly hasn't thought out what he's going to do at all because they've got her as a hostage and he immediately has to throw down his weapons and give it. <laughs> yeah. He's not got a plan. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> Here we go. Is, is he going to talk? Is he, is he, I can't remember if he's spoken already now. Well, she's done enough talking for the pair of them. <laughs> No, I'm not going to. I'm not going to start criticising her. I've, I've just. I picked up on um on on the crew being just finding her a little bit taxing. <laughs> from you know from the from the bonus features on the on the Blu-ray and stuff. She's apparently friends with Monarch and Golden's daughter, so they they were, she was friends with the family. I think she did say when she was on the film, Monarch and. I don't think he kind of remembered her or like just was like oh okay <laughs> sort of carried on you know because I mean they did all they, I, I don't want to overstate it because I know they, they, this was a particularly close uh, cast and crew wasn't it I believe they, yeah. they really got along well and I know um, I've, uh, Sam I've interviewed Sam Furstenberg a couple of times and he sent me a, a huge file of behind-the-scenes photos. I should forward them on to you if you've not seen them, actually. Oh, sweet, uh, yeah. From this, from this um, film. And they included... Uh, um, like they've, they've obviously had a couple of uh, reunions since because the, there, are, there are shots of the same... You know, the, the key cast and crew members all together as people of, should we say, advanced years. All apart <laughs> from her, actually, looks exactly the same. She has not aged... It's it's crazy. Is it's, it's, it's Judy Aronson? Is that's it. Judy Aronson? It. Yeah, Judy, yeah. That's, I, forgot, I forgot her name earlier. I do apologise, people. But, you know, we've got the comedy psychic as well, kind of like, you know, the bouffant hair guy. He just, like... Actually, I, I think he's actually quite quite well cast in the movie. I think he kind of adds... He adds to the film a bit of needed comedy, um, even though he's a little bit over the top. But it's like, it's the 80s, isn't it? He's right, and uh, John Lamotta there as well is another um, another significant casting. I think he was a a can as well, certainly a Sam Furstenberg stalwart. He's in pretty much every movie Sam made, and he's um, he's the he's the the, the cop in Ninja Three. I'm going to keep going on about Ninja Three because it's my favourite Sam Furstenberg movie, one of my favourite canon movies. But he he plays the main the main cop character's partner. He gets uh, gets killed in his pool room at home. Oh yeah, I was thinking of the one in Ninja Three, the one who's like ridiculously hairy. Like the hairy yeah, no, 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 not the hairy monster. <laughs> That's the main guy. That's the uh, Billy Seacord, I think. Yeah, his name is. It's, it's, it's guy's kind of a walking hard on, isn't he? Just like <laughs> hairy motherfucker. Yeah, he's, he's he's literally chatting up the the witness to the murder <laughs> whilst she's giving her witness statement. <laughs> <laughs> I love how this movie has got like you've got, you've got like a Frenchman involved and you've got Japanese involved. Well, I think he he's not actually French. This guy is he the actor? The character is, but I believe he's an American soap star. But he's putting on a French accent. Putting on a French accent, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He does look quite French, I suppose. He does a bit, yeah. That's what confused me. So apparently, when they shot this, obviously it was during the time where they were under a, Philippines under a dictatorship, you know. So it was very much. Uh, the cast and crew sort of saw the poverty around them, but when you sort of they went to the hotel to sort of stay there for, doing filming, this kind of opulent kind of building, and uh, you could see this kind of massive disconnect between you know the the rich folk and the and the and the and the, and the, and the locals, you know. Um, but it's always like it was always a canon though. They'd always like just, instead of. Just go to countries where they can get these huge tax breaks, or the, exactly. the currency was just so low. You know they can go a lot, go further. You know? Which is kind of what did for this series because it was uh, the second one shot in South Africa, and dude, I don't know if you know this story, but Dudikoff didn't didn't like that. He wasn't comfortable um, filming in in a, in a country under apartheid, and obviously mm, there was a lot of international know. pressure not to do business with South Africa, and as a result, South Africa offered increasingly lucrative tax breaks and so on 
So they went back for the third one, and Dudikoff. The reason Dudikoff isn't in it apparently is he, he said, I'm, "I'm not, I'm not filming in South Africa." So without him, it flopped. Um, the, the fourth one got made with him in it, but with a you know no budget, and it was pretty ropey. Because he said, "I know," because there was like, yeah, I think for the recent Blu-ray from Eighty Eight Films, it was not fit. Well, it was a couple of years old now. But he'd said, oh, I was unavailable at the time. You know, didn't want to... I don't think he sort of revealed that that nugget of truth. I think he uh, I think he was doing that platoon kind of movie. What was, I can't remember what the name of it was now. But obviously after this, he did Avenging Force. And then they went and did um, Ninja 2. But I think Michael was very much, you know, yeah, uh, fully game to do sequels, you know. But obviously, yeah, I think come number three, he was like, you know, he made the right decision, you know. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I can understand him not wanting to talk about it because it, it's it, it would you know it's kind of throwing your friends under the bus, isn't it? Those who did do it, mm, um, yeah, yeah. It's you don't want to be appearing to judge them, especially when someone like Steve James probably has, uh, uh, you know, a more authoritative position to come from on that score. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a shame about Steve James because he he, didn't, he passed away. Is it a pancreatic cancer? Wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. That's so sad because he. I mean, to me, to be honest, he's the real star of these first two movies. I I love Steve James in these films. He, his character is just Jackson is just fantastic. He just has this incredible charisma, doesn't he? And yeah. Screen presence. You know, he was going to be. Well, they originally had thought him to be Jax in Mortal Kombat yeah. the movie. But, yeah, there are uh, some some rumors say he was actually cast and was all set to go, and others that he was being considered. But yeah, I mean, who else? Who else could? Should have been Jacks, really. I mean, that is Steve James. Yeah, yeah. Well, Steve James died of the same thing Bill Hicks did, the comedian. And uh, you sort of see Steve James was in such tip top condition. Yeah. That didn't matter what condition you were in, you know, it's going to get you. And you, and you know that he's in tip top condition because this is one of the few scenes he's in where he's wearing a shirt. <laughs> yeah. and, and that's in his whole career, so not just this movie, his entire career. <laughs> he gets proper hammy though in number two where he's like he's taking the posing to the next level he's <laughs> fighting the dudes at the end god yeah. it's so funny it's because it became like a cartoon and i think it is it is a bit much of a cartoon i think as ninjas became so popular in the 80s i think mainly down to canon who had yeah think, okay, yeah very much so kids who had seen these movies on vhs and you know see gi joe had ninjas in it and i think there's kind of a all sort of kick-started with Enter the Ninja. And um, despite that film not being a great movie, I think as they went on, you know, they sort of figured out the sort of formula and what of what of what people wanted. And um, and having this, this this idea with this kind of the ninja kind of mystique and kind of mystery about it, combining it with literally like American culture and American, you know, the sort of machoism. Yeah. Sort of, Menachem nailed it with that. Absolutely, yeah. And, and that was the whole driving concept behind this movie, wasn't it? That it, it must be an American <clears throat> ninja, you know, not just for the title. Yeah. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, the character uh, Cole, I think his name is, in Enter the Ninja, Franco Nero, is mm. is American. He's Texan. He's dubbed. So you don't know that it's an Italian actor. Um, you do know that that Italian actor can't do martial arts at all because... <laughs> It's just embarrassing. Unlike in this, they do, it's not like they don't give they don't really give Michael Dudikoff a lot to do, and he's naturally, you know, suited to doing what he does do. Whereas yeah. Franco Nero in the first one, there's a scene where he's doing where he's practicing with his nunchucks. Yeah, I was thinking that. My God, they, I mean, surely they could have just taken five minutes out and had someone show him the basics. It's just awful. But the whole point was to make this American, and that, that's why it's set on a on an army base, isn't it? Because they had to shoot in the Philippines for financial reasons, and they were worried that was going to sort of deplete the um, the American aspect. So they redressed the yeah. Filipino army base to make it look American, and at least were unable to you know populate the screen with American faces and voices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's also I think with this, with this movie, I love the trailer they put out because it's got a lot of sort of bespoke material in it where. There you see he's got the mask on to all this smoky atmosphere. He's using the size and he pulls out the sword and he and he you know he pull, poses in front of that American flag. It's such and that became the the poster for the movie. Just Dudikoff holding his sword, you know, and it's simple and effective. And I think it's very much like uh, 
is it breaking they did you mm. know like it really captured what was going on yeah or like what audiences wanted and then when they do the sequels they begin to kind of like lose control and just sort of you know audience are like no it's just getting even more silly you know well, that, um, that's the thing with this series it, it it's not immediately obvious unless you stop and think about it but the plots are i mean the, this first one isn't isn't too silly but the plots for all the others, there's five of these things in total, if you include the semi-official fifth part, they're all mental. They're completely <laughs> insane. You the, the second one's about a scientist kidnapping <laughs> marines in order to make them into super ninjas. <laughs> so that they're better at selling drugs. <laughs> None of it... I mean, that doesn't make any sense at all, really. And then in the third one, <laughs> it's... um. It's another scientist, and he's making a bioweapon. And in order to demonstrate how deadly this bioweapon is, he hosts an enormous martial arts contest so that he can use the bioweapon on the winner. Because that will prove to the world how, how effective it is. Because it's, it's, they're all bizarre. I do love this scene, though. This, this scene, asking Stitches, it's like the ninja playground, right? I think to really tie the scene together... All they needed was some ninjas in the background on space hoppers. <laughs> that would be so. That would be like, yes, the best scene ever. But this is entirely inspired by Hong Kong ninja movies. I think that this training area, for one thing, was a mm. big deal. In you know, a lot of Hong Kong martial arts movies have, the, have exactly this kind of training. Over, but also the colourful ninjas. This is what is this? Eighty five, I think. Eighty five. Yeah. So enter the ninja launched the whole ninja thing in 81 i think it was and then there were a bunch of uh movies made in hong kong and america but godfrey ho was the hong kong filmmaker who really latched on to the ninja gravy train and he was the one who started introducing these ridiculous color color schemed costumes and like um there's uh, there's one movie where there's a guy where there's a ninja with a tartan costume tartan outfit <laughs> There's the famous one where with Richard Harrison in a camouflage ninja, ninja. So I think I think this was very much a result of people watching Hong Kong movies. You think that I always thought the colours would represent their sort of skill level, like a like a belt. You know what I mean, like red belt, green belt. But to be, when you got black belt, you, you you can wear a black outfit. You know. Yeah. <laughs> what degree of useless they are. So one ninja's a bit out of shape, you know. <laughs> one with a limp. <laughs> <laughs> it's like watching um I oh, when I watched the, the first Ninja Turtles movie, you see some of the foot clan are a bit fat, you know, in the background. I think I don't think I think they're they're right for this uh, foot soldier team. I don't know. Are we trying to are we catching up after complaining about having a stitch? <laughs> I can't believe they got this playground thing. It's also like you know, like Enter the Dragon. You have these people training, don't you, at the beginning? The sort of the, the yeah. sort of shoulder guys kind of working out, but they're just doing simple like punches <laughs> for ages. Yeah. This like, this has got a climbing frame in there. So this, I, I, it's the it's the thing with this with the uh, with the weights that swing back and forth with the yeah. blades out. I don't know if you notice <laughs> late, swings later on when um when the American ninja is is chasing the black star ninja <laughs> and he runs to he follows him through the assault course instead of just walking going round it. <laughs> sort of becomes American gladiator. Isn't it's it? exactly. Yeah. It's like the, is it a hot shot? One of the hot shots movies I think has a scene where it just suddenly becomes. <laughs> Oh man! Oh. Oh, you, you just know these are not people to be trusted. Eh? These are proper canon villains. These are. Oh yeah, yeah. They're kind of like, uh, like the sort of studio executives who've just been like given roles in the film. Yeah. You know, <laughs> <laughs> they sort of they, they, they sort of deal with foreign sales. You know, so they they, they speak English. It, it could well be the case. I mean, this was in. You know, obviously they had some they had some money on this. It's not a it's not a cheap canon movie as such. It's a mid it's a mid budget canon yeah, film. Yeah, yeah. but you, they're still going to have to cast locally as much as they can because any mm. any white face that they can't find locally has to be flown out and put up in a hotel and so on. Yeah, because everyone had to be. Uh, Sam first and both said everyone on this would would be paid scale, so the basic the minimum you can you know pay them. Obviously, Dudikoff's agent was like, 
no way because he's done these two other movies he's a he's people know who he is so they managed to sort of wrangle it so he got paid double but um i mean i still i don't know what the scale was at the time yeah not but, a lot uh, you'd imagine no i mean because steve james was uh, had a had a presence as well because he'd, he'd done he'd certainly done the exterminator mm. by this point i can't think what else he would Oh, I saw a sequel to that not long ago. It's a terrible film. <laughs> yeah, isn't it just? <laughs> so the act, the main act is like drunk all the way through it. <laughs> I can't believe it. It's like, is he sober? Is it was it Ginty in the second one? Or I can't remember if he comes back for the second one. I think it is the same dude. Yeah, I mean, he's he's always entertaining Ginty. The uh, yes, yeah, Steve James had done quite a bit beforehand. Wait a minute, he's in Weird Science. Oh, is, oh yeah, he's a guy that he's in the bar at the beginning. In, in, in Weird Science, you know. He was in. He was in a, a few. He was in Delta Force as well, and uh, Hero in the Terror, which is a really underrated Chuck Norris canon movie. Well, Delta Force will come, I think, the following year, wouldn't it? Yeah, it's eighty six. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, Steve James had done stuff. So he, you know, I, but I don't think maybe his agent didn't fight enough for him to get double, um, which is a shame. He, he he seems to have had one of those careers where he was just constantly underestimated and maligned yeah. and not given the opportunities. No, it was just a. I think it's probably just the uh, this, this Hollywood system at the time. So there, there's the that's the that's the throw, the pose. Yeah, just the pose. Coolest things. This scene is just fantastic. I love it. I forgot to mention the score at the beginning. It's just <laughs> the score sounds like it belongs to a seventies cop show. <laughs> yes. It really does. There's nothing ninja like related to it. Nothing like mysterious. I think there may be a couple of elements later on when he sees his teacher or something like that. Some sort of mystical elements kind of to the vibe. But most of it, and near the beginning, this film's in mono as well. The film was kind of, I think the majority didn't put much out in Dolby stereo. So it doesn't, it still sounds a bit shrill when the music does. Hmm. This is where Dudikoff, I think, is pretty ill at this point. Just like sweating buckets. He, so yeah, like, he really is, isn't he? And he said his he said his whole body was just like shaking, his bones ached. It's like God I'm trying to make this movie. Exactly. And if you look at what he's doing, it's it's largely throws and grapples and stuff. He's not doing the the energetic punching, kicking stuff so much. Wow. Mind you, that's kind of his style, I guess, because he couldn't do the the, the kicks anyway. Doesn't do that many kicks. It's number two. He does a bit more. He does a bit more. Yeah. Yeah. And then number three, you get David Bradley replace him, who's just like lightning. Like, he's, he's extraordinary to watch, I think. He's one of the really underrated martial arts stars of the 80s. He reminds me of Scott Adkins watching him now. Really? Really elaborate, fast legwork. Bradley in Blood Hunt. He did Cyborg Cop 2. I mean, under yeah, first... he did both the Cyborg. They're Sam Furstenberg again. Yeah. I think he actually worked with Furstenberg more than more often than Michael Dudikoff did. Blimey. But he hasn't, he hasn't acted since 1997. What, no, he, he's... He's still alive, right? He's famously he disappeared. He, he all, all anybody knows is that he became very religious and then um, broke off contact effectively with... With the, I, I've talked to Sam about him, and they they stayed friends and, so, and would see each other. I think they lived near each other, and then he just kind of disappeared, and no one's been able to track him down since. So he has a Facebook profile, which occasionally gets an update, so he's alive. Mm. Good. It's a bit like Rob Bottin, who disappeared off the face of the planet. You know, yeah. No one, these... no one knows where he is. No, he hasn't done any interviews since like the nine, what, early two thousands, maybe. Strange. I think he's in like real estate or things like that. Just sort of left the industry, got sick of it. Knock it off. It's interesting. Like when they start shooting stuff, like that. Then, like the uh, the close ups, you can tell the, sh the the sun is going down. Then the next shot, it's like really bright. There's quite a few of those shots coming up later on, where obviously they're just battling with the weather and the time. I think the guy who photographed this also photographed uh, Masters of the Universe. Yeah, yeah, Hananya Bear. Yeah, he yeah. Did, he did a bunch of these. A bunch of these movies. He he also did. And in fact, the, almost the entire crew, or the, certainly the key crew, uh, not not the local Filipinos on this, were also on Ninja Three. 
it's I think they essentially just went straight from one movie to the next, and also the the break in sequel. <laughs> Electric Boogaloo. Electric Boogaloo. Yeah, the uh, yeah because I remember um, Gary Goddard when working on He Man, he'd said like the deep the director of photography, uh, the photographer, sorry, was um, everything looked too flat. And he kept saying, look, we need more color, more crazy stuff. So he really pushed it. I think that's probably end up being um, the guy's sort of best work yeah, oh, I, as a cinematographer. Yeah, I, yeah he's, a, he's a generally speaking, he's, I think he's just a good cinematographer. Mm. Although I would never have framed this scene quite like this because I've always found it so distracting how there's a bin every two yards for some reason <laughs> and there's nothing in any of them. <laughs> <laughs> Almost nothing. That's blatantly just got like a cardboard bag or something that's been put in the bag first, and then the bag's been put in. The... I thought they looked like toxic waste bins, you know. But uh... if you ever notice, if you go back and watch it, it's, they're just going along in a straight line, and it's every couple of yards there's another bin. Is it, why? Why is there a bin every few yards in the space? <laughs> It's always the movies where they like empty bins or they fall into trash, compact, you know, trash kind of, you know, carriers. It's always just full of like <laughs> cardboard boxes and bubble wrap. <laughs> it's never like mouldy fruit and veg, or whatever, you know. <laughs> that bin was practically empty. He's wasting. They're all virtually empty. <laughs> oh, where's the love interest? Oh, well, hello. See, a moment like this, you couldn't. You need someone like Dudikoff to pull it off. Yeah, he's got the James Dean look, hasn't he? Exactly. That's yeah, he's, he's got a smouldering presence. Menachem was so like in love with him because he's just like he's got the look. Yeah. He's got the leading man material, hasn't he? Glad to see you're still human. I think he's sort of the next wave of canon, but because when Dudikoff came into into canon, it was like at their height of eighty five, and then the next two years they just crumbled. So. He'd find himself in more and more lower budget canon features, you know. On a sinking ship. This is what they all say, isn't it? I mean, Charles Bronson always used to complain about this. Every, the next canon movie was meant to be bigger than the last, but it was always smaller. Yeah. He got, yeah, very sort of dis, dis, disenchanted with canon, didn't he? Like dis, dis, he sort of lost... Um, he got, did so many sequels, didn't he? Of Death Wish. And like the fifth one... He did with um, Monarchy with for twentieth first century film. You know, had l- even less money than the than the fourth one. It's like God. It's underrated that fifth movie. I think in in, a, in an ironic way. Anyway, everyone loves part three because it's so ridiculous. But the fifth one's almost as stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Number three is just like conservatives shooting poor people. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, there's a scene in that scene, the, the famous scene where he. Just proactively finds people to murder is just fantastic. It's unbelievable. I <laughs> think you get a stunt double for throwing a, a trash can at a car as it drives past. I'm like, why do you need a stunt double? You know? <laughs> These bouffant hair, God, it's so John Peters. You know, oh, I could just, I could look at Steve James all day. He's been chiselled out of marble. Isn't he? <laughs> I'll get her no. He's got this, this almost constantly sort of unassuming expression as well. He's, Are you sure? he, he kind of, he just, the the, 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 this calm, sensible, reasonable energy just drips out of him. Yeah. As long as you don't mess with his bike. <laughs> I think if if he hadn't passed away, I think he would definitely would have had a, a big career sort of boost in the nineties and the early two thousands. He would have been used more because people that who grew up watching him would have become filmmakers themselves and gone, "We got to put him in this movie." And I think that's often the case with a lot of actors, you know, who sort of, sort of sort of maybe sort of disappeared for a bit, often come back thanks to filmmakers being, you know, fans of their work as a kid. Oh, that music! It's oh god the. The guy on the trumpet's like running out of breath. Spot the amazing moving mudguard here. So they see the front mudguard. Is they've just put a, they've just put oh. a, a red chass, a red fairing over a scrambler <laughs> of some sort for the jump. And when he landed that, the ho- oh god, it looked like he actually hurt himself. Well, no, famously he, he did. He, he face planted into the into the screen because that was done by um, 
Steve, uh, Steve Lambert. Uh, uh, yeah. Simply because no one else would do it. Apparently, they. Yeah. I remember reading somewhere that they had two or three, like expert bike jumpers, and they just wouldn't do it. They thought it was too dangerous, so Lambert had to do it. Yeah, because I think I think they apparently bottled out five minutes before shooting. Like, nope, not doing it. Oh, <laughs> sure. well, that's it, isn't it? If it's five minutes before, the stunt coordinator's got to step up. That's <laughs> it's nuts. Dudikoff's hair has always kind of been the same, isn't it, throughout these movies, where it's kind of, it's all slick back, but it's got this kind of, like, flat top to it. It's weird. It's the weirdest hair yeah. style. It sort of weirdly suits him. Is, is, it, is it legal? for? I'm always amused in, especially canon movies featuring military types, just how half of them are, are clearly, they've just been rounded up from central casting, and they've got hair that would never be allowed in the military. No, you'd have you'd have to have that quite short that hair. It's like Steve Steven Seagal. Whenever Steven Seagal plays a plays a military type, I always find myself <laughs> wondering if you're really allowed a ponytail in the Marines. <laughs> no, he wouldn't. God's sake, that'll get everywhere. Get that fucking hair out of my face. You'd be like, oh, a little bit of sexy jazz music. But then again, it's like for an 18 rated movie, you'd expect if it was Van Damme in this movie, he'd sleep with her. But it's all <laughs> it's all kind of played very sort of like death like soft. It's this all it's all kind of what ifs, you know what I mean? It's kind of you don't see anything, you just uh well, it, sort of see what's gonna happen. They never really knew what to do in movies like this, did they? I always think. Whether whether they should spend time on the love interest. I mean, at the end of the day, the only real reason to do it is to have a sex scene or a nude scene. Yeah, and yeah. is is there any point? They tend to ditch certainly the the lower budget, more action orientated, canon equivalents of this. They they don't tend to bother with a love interest, do they? No, they don't. They're not that that's going to have them go on a date, go for food and stuff, and yeah, you know, it just they just get straight to the bonking, you know. Or she just say, or she just shows her boobs, and that'll be, and it'll just cut. At least got the boob shot, you know. But <laughs> with this, it's kind of like why why kind of have it. If it's, they know it's going to be a film aimed at adults. Why kind of have this kind of soft approach? But maybe it's a Sam Furstenberg's kind of like, well, you know, it's it's kind of more of a lighter touch. Yeah, but this, I, which is fine. I'm not complaining about it. But I'm just kind of like, you know, the mentality of them at the time. It like is producers because know. it's a because it's a fundamentally good screenplay. I genuinely believe that. Um, it this scene this scene it serves all kinds of purposes as well, doesn't it? Because it. Mm. It, it establishes the relationships between all of these people. She knows him, and the nature of their relationship is this. These two are working together, and obviously he's very dodgy. It, it gives it gives them a chance to be, it gives Michael Dudikoff and her a chance to build their chemistry, which I think is actually very good. Yeah, yeah, and it, as, as I'll say, as you mentioned, as you're highlighting, everyone's sort of connected mm. with, this, with the A plot and the B plot. Yeah. So it doesn't feel, yeah, it's, it was, the writer apparently knew Bruce Lee, you know, because he was a military guy who had martial arts training, he trained with Bruce Lee. Um, must be in the early 70s, late, early, yeah, early 70s, late 60s. Which, yeah, he, is that, which, which writer? So it was James Silk, who, um, I know, because I know there were different writers at different points. Because the guy who, the main writer of this, he's been interviewed a bunch of times. Um, where has he gone? Sorry, folks. Oh, I just, um, it's Paul. Paul D. Paul D. Melchi. Oh, like okay, yeah, I know the name, but I'm not. I can't place him. Yeah, he wrote the um, screenplay. It's, this it, this is all believable stuff to me, and it it adds a lot. It makes this feel like uh, rather than a low budget B movie, it makes it feel like a a, a, a real movie, you know, a real A mm. studio film. I think the old thing with I remember uh, Master Universe director Gary Goddard said that like, Canon always got their films like processed at the same place in New York, so they all and it all um, graded as well, so they all kind of had, took on a similar look, yeah, which he didn't like at all. He made it just kind of look cheap, and um, that's why he strived to sort of go somewhere else to have it graded and processed. And this also seems to be following the similar cam- Canon look, where there isn't there wasn't much played with in terms of the lighting it's always everything seems a little bit too flat and you could do a lot bit more with the scene but mm. it's not in terms of like the camera work it's kind of fine it was the placement everything positions yeah 
he always feels like it's, it's cut from the same cloth as other kind of yeah I know what you mean actually yeah kind of look photographically especially those shots in the Philippines is it the second one because when I think about the second one it, it looks it's a lot more colourful it's much brighter in my mind I don't know if that's because I mean that that one was shot in South Africa different circumstances it's very very sunny and so on all the time and there are a lot more people in Hawaiian shirts and so on but it, it's got a, in my mind it's got a slightly different look the sequel it, I think it has a bit more of a interesting production design as well so it, I think that's making use of better locations really it's a bit more varied we're always seeing is kind of a military base mm. do you once you see it once you kind of seen everything you know I think that they wanted to shoot here as much as possible because they wanted that feel of Americans and America and you know an excuse to have American flags in the background and so on <laughs> perfectly timed. <laughs> Oh, it's the part where he's going to get, he's going to get, um, you know, they're trying to stop him, aren't they? He gets led into that uh, warehouse and they attack him when it's got some amusing fight scenes coming up now. Oh, yeah, this. <laughs> Drunk locals. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this scene is in, I think, every American ninja movie. Either Michael Dudikoff or David Bradley is tricked into going somewhere and <laughs> finds himself in an ambush. Do not enter. <laughs> they sort of go in. You know, I'm going in. <laughs> he it's, it's, it really sells these moments, doesn't he? He knows something's wrong, but it's not. It's not been done by a hack. It's not been telegraphed that he knows something's wrong. Mm. The Dudikoff senses are kicking in. <laughs> it's another ninja movie stalwart, isn't it? A, a scene in a fight scene in a warehouse. For some reason, ninjas love warehouses. <laughs> it's kind of been like watching the old 70s Spider-Man live-action show where they just have like a fight in like a, a random room or something with boxes. Yeah, for God's sake, you're like... <laughs> no, the bit coming up in a minute where... Like, then they throw like this chain around him and he pulls it and then he throws the swords back. <laughs> and the sword gets thrown into the guy's stomach. It's like it's like, it's like a spring mechanism. It, oh, it's it's so silly, but you can't help but love it. Oh, a bit of synth there. My God, a bit of synth thrown into the score. Jesus. Uh, telltale falling rice. <laughs> it must be an injury if there's rice falling. <laughs> They bleed right. <laughs> <laughs> Ninja Star, Ray. I loved that throw when I was a kid as well. <laughs> I don't think you actually see him let go of it. He just kind of moves his hand off frame. He must have thrown it. You know, that is good lighting. I like that. Yeah, it's a fantastic shot. I'm hardly thinking of Scooby Doo at all. I was reading a text on the on the board there. It says stock card. What else does it say? Some other little just random nonsense. I wonder if it's the same board that was behind the um, army guy he took the, tra the uh, truck from a minute ago. Must have been. It's repurposing it. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point, Rob. Yeah. Well, that's Ooh. good. See, Dudikoff sells all this stuff, though. Yeah. Uh, they don't have him do things he can't do. That's the thing. He just doesn't do all that much, which is always better than having them do things that they clearly just can't do. You used to, you used to get a lot of that in early 80s like action movies or thrillers where the protagonist would have to do just a little bit of martial arts. And it just looks ridiculous. Like There's a way you kick someone, no matter what the martial art. And, yeah. you know, it's not... It doesn't look like someone playing football. <laughs> This is the bit, right? He pulls it in, the next go. Oh, yes, yeah. It's so stupid. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but it's just always when you're eight years old, you'd be like, that oh, man, that's so real. That must have happened. Can Ninjas they? can do that. <laughs> they do get more and more. I think it's the fifth one. 
there's a ninja who who actually does the disappearing and reappearing in a cloud of smoke thing. Oh, amazing. And he can do it like in closed rooms and everything. It's properly supernatural. Oh, well. Well, they do that also like in Ninja Turtles the movie. The Foot Clan used to psh, the smoke things disappear. Yeah. You know, but they don't I don't think, I don't think do they deploy it in this. No, I don't I think number think two so. they do it. They, number well, two they use it. Oh, do they? They they appear very rapidly from out of nowhere, but Mm. See the stunt here is nuts. I I, I, I was going to say that actually. I every time I've, I've the few movies do this stunt, and every time it makes me cringe. As a motorcyclist, it makes me cringe because I yeah. that is, just looks so dangerous. Look at that! Oh my god, I've never noticed that. <sighs> yeah, that first Brutal. shot. Yeah. Before it cuts away, he's clearly about to plow into the side of that truck. Yeah. I bet that was Steve oh. Lambert. Oh, definitely. Health and safety. He looks at the form and, nah, screw it. Yeah. <laughs> Rips it up. Let's go. <laughs> Steve Lambert, it's like he's indestructible. <laughs> that's, yeah, I bet that's who was, you, the, whoever's stunt, in fact, it must be Steve Lambert, but his hair is noticeably different to, <laughs> to Michael Dudikoff's. But that was Dudikoff riding alongside the truck and then holding out and holding on to the truck. That's not, you know, that's one of those stunts that's a lot more dangerous than it looks like, I think. I know he did, like, about 90% of his own work in this, he said. Maybe a little bit too generous there, but um, he did quite a lot of it. <laughs> so many cuts here. Cause they're just, like, going really slowly for the close-ups, like... Five miles an hour, where you know he's like Ugh, getting hit by the vehicle. Still though, I, I wouldn't. It's got Indiana Jones here. Yes, it's another. Yeah, I was thinking that actually. It's another, like the the um the, the mismatched couple on their adventure together. There's a few moments here that make me think of Indiana Jones in this movie. Hmm. It's not about the ninja craze because we had loads of tons of video games about ninjas. Like there was. Like Shinobi, Ninja Gaiden, it's even like for the kids, just for kids to play, you know, it's just like this kind of. I don't know what, when it sort of died out, ninjas. Maybe, maybe come the sort of late eighties. Maybe Canon had milked it too far. Yeah, <laughs> I think I don't know. It kind of it 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 had its it's had its big explosion in the early eighties. Canon kind of wrung more out of it than they should have done, I think, and it yeah. died off. During the late eighties, at least in the US, Hong Kong was still producing also worse and worse movies. But then it all changed, didn't it? In sort of about nineteen, it was eighty nine when Kickboxer came out, and yeah. suddenly it was all about tournament movies or kickboxing movies. Yeah, it was because yeah. of Bloodsport and Kickboxer. And then we had Best of the Best and things like that, didn't we? Yeah, and they try they tried to repeat this formula as well. There's Sam Furstenberg made with David Bradley uh, American Samurai. Yes, which uh, which is a, a quite a, you know it's a decent movie actually. There's some really good fight scenes in it and some good action. Is it one of those Imperial Entertainment kind of movies? Yes, it was someone like that. It was yeah, it's or low budget. yeah, or maybe even an early Millennium. But yes, it's someone like that. The, the same, I think probably the same company that Sam was making Delta Force sequels for as well around the same time. <laughs> Delta Force 3, 4, whatever. I always loved the, 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 the omnibus kind of documentary on canon called The Last Moguls. Yeah. And it's got Monarchum and that, the premiere like event party in the, <laughs> the car park. In the car park. park. <laughs> Yeah, and, he's, and he gets interviewed by someone, but Arkham's like, it's going to be the movie of the century. Like, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, right, okay. <laughs> I might be imagining it, but I feel like every time there's a moment when it goes quiet and during the footage of that car park scene, you just hear from somewhere Menachem selling something to someone, <laughs> anything. <laughs> he's writing another contract on the napkin. Make that movie. There's a really funny interview with um, Chuck Norris from that, um, I think there's a, the, the, I think there's a bit of it in the Last Moguls, and there's a bit of it here and there in a couple of documentaries on like Blu-ray releases of the odd Chuck mm. Norris movie. But there's um, someone showed me the the whole uncut one, which allegedly, apparently, Cannon or Chuck didn't want to do the rounds, didn't want going public because really? Chuck Norris is chewing his face off. He is blatantly, well, I, sorry, I'd be. I, 
careful what I say here, but it appears <laughs> that Chuck Norris may have imbibed um, something that he, you know, he, he, I think he's been relatively open about going through a phase of being a bit of a tear away at the height of his fame. And um, yeah, he's, he's, yeah, he's, it's not the normal Chuck somehow. There's something wrong with him. Oh no, not Chuck. <laughs> 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 well, you know how much I care about my Chuck. <laughs> exactly, we all love Chuck. But it's, it's the eighties, mate. It's canon. You got to be high as a kite to work with. <laughs> <laughs> Delta Force Five. I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> if you're launching your new movie in a car park, you need some form of adulteration. I think. <laughs> Everyone before attending that party was just like <laughs> snoring up like a coke and going in, just to make it bearable. <laughs> I want to know where everyone parked. What did, how did yeah. that work? <laughs> I love it. Um, Dudikoff's like, he's like Spider Man in this, jumping around. And he's doing it himself as well. Yeah. You yeah. see him climbing up, jumping over stuff, and, you know. Some people are just physically gifted. It's like um, Jim Catter, which oh, actually mate, yeah. shares a few connections with this movie. But it, like the guy in that, Kurt Thomas, was. Just, just useless at martial arts. He just couldn't do it. But no. obviously, he's a world champion gymnast, so he's amazing at physical mm -hmm. stuff. The jumping that about film is and weird. So. Jim Carter is weird, man. There's a whole bit. He tripped, tripped us all out, man. We, we weren't even on drugs. We're like we, <laughs> the bit where they go in the village, and it all just takes forever. Forever, it goes on for ages. Just like, oh my god. It's just watching them try to figure out ways to fit gymnastics into a martial arts oh, movie. Mate, is... there's got to be a hobby horse somewhere, you know what I mean? No, it is. Yeah, there is. A, there is a. There's a scene where, it's, in fact, it's one of the most notorious scenes where <laughs> the hero is being chased by an entire village load of psycho weirdos, and in the middle of the village square is a pommel horse. <laughs> so he just he swings about the pommel horse, and everyone approaches him one at a time and gets sent flying. <laughs> That's not something that Loaded Weapon 1 would take the piss out of, you know it, what I mean? It, it really lines is. Up, lines up to get knocked down. I interviewed Richard Norton about, about that movie, because he plays the villain, and, um, and he said, yeah, it was, meant to be a, it was meant to be a butcher's table, but it, it, does, it looks exactly like a pommel horse and is not presented as a butcher's table. No. <laughs> it's got handles on it, you know? <laughs> Richard Norton's got a credit in this. Yeah, yeah, he's, yeah, he's got a small role. I... Th does he does he does he play one of the guys who gets strangled in the prison? Yes, yeah, he's a military policeman. He's who yeah gets. I thought it was, but I thought Richard Norton had already done enough movies at that point. Why is he just being this kind of throwaway character? I thought that as well because I didn't. I never knew he was in this I, until I noticed his name in the credits, and I thought he's credited as a military policeman. Oh, he must be one of those. Guys. Yeah, but what the hell was he doing? Because he was in because uh, the. Enter the Ninja created the Ninja craze, but the Octagon, the Chuck Norris movie, came out the, a year before, mm. which also featured Tadashi Yamashita. And Richard Norton had, you know, did a lot of work in that, and he'd done a, a handful of uh, Hong Kong movies, I think. So, yeah, it's a really small role for him at this stage. He did a bunch of movies, a bunch of movies with Cynthia Rothrock yeah. you know, in the mid 80s, so he wasn't like a nobody. And. And and because Richard Norton at the time, he could have been like the dark side of Dudikoff, you know what I mean? Another guy he knew, but he turned evil. I mean, that would have been a great sort of villain. Yeah, yeah. No, he, he he made for a good villain. He was one of one of those great all-purpose martial arts stars. I love Richard Norton. He, could, he, he could be villains. He could be heroes. He was he he conquered the Hong Kong industry, and you know the B movie anyway, uh, Hollywood industry, which is really unusual for. Western stars to be able to hack it in Hong Kong. There's not many who can who can deal with the way things work there. No, because I I I sort of became aware of Norton when he did City Hunter as the main villain. Yeah, I mean, oh, he's he was brilliant. So good in that, so quick. So you know, you can yeah, as you say, you can really sort of you can do the Hong Kong films without looking like a fool. You know, I mean, he did. You know, he looked like an absolute pro. He could match them. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, and he could keep up uh, with the with the damage caused to you as well because you, you've got to be pretty tough to work in Hong Kong it's like Cynthia Rothrock's always been a hero for the same reason to go there particularly as a woman without wanting to sound sexist because they are not going to give you uh, you know they're not going to go easy on you just because of that 
No, no, no. Michelle Yeoh and other other actresses kind of, you know, complained about the difficult working conditions, you know. Well, has got to put American flag somewhere. Got to remind people. It's America, people! <laughs> That's good lighting. Look at that. Light coming through. That's good stuff. Yeah. I love this bit, though, where the ninja comes in to kill him. He's kind of <laughs> hide behind in the toilet. <laughs> and sort of climbs over <laughs> without, being, without getting caught. Great. The lighting there didn't match at all. There we go. What? He pulled up at like eight o'clock in the evening, and he sets up the steps at like three three p.m. or something. You know. I don't. They're not going to do a lot of reprints, are they? I used to work in post production. You know, one of the one of my early jobs was um, transferring digital uh, stuff shot digitally and on early digital to thirty five millimeter film. So you had to deal with the labs, and the, the, it, it was all printed in this big thing. It was a massive photocopier type of camera, and it goes off to the lab and comes back. And it was extraordinary how often you'd have to get something reprinted because the, mm. because of the, because it's a chemical process. Yeah, it, you know the front the, the front of a reel isn't necessarily even going to match the end of a reel. Ne- never mind from reel to reel. If you've got a real eye for it, which I don't, but you know the graders who do they they used to obsess over it constantly is getting that, new this prints was, this was your set so digital effects getting exported to yeah film, well right? both actually yeah it, uh, it's in the 2000s so yeah like the harry potter movies were still being shot and screened on print but the effects were obviously all done digitally so so they'd yeah. be printed but also like early movies like 28 days later uh, was what was one of my first jobs was transferring that from digital to to film because it's a it's a fairly complicated process the color space changes and all that kind of thing they also but they'd also be exporting weren't you like that 2k max wasn't it yeah so back still, then it was doing it i think back then it was 2k yeah i think i don't know what they do now but but well, mind you so now it probably doesn't really happen very much because everything's digital almost everything mm. I can't see Canon spending a lot of time going back and forth, paying for reprints and reprints and reprints until they've got exactly the mm. the, the level of you know all the all the balances that they want. That's that thing he's doing with his hand. <laughs> it's because his fingers all mangled up. You're like, oh no, they're trapped. <laughs> Here we go. Well, he's gonna try and break in and kill Dudikoff, but Dudikoff escapes from him by literally hiding behind. And then above the door. That's right, yeah. There's um doesn't um uh, it's where we see um Richard Norton. Yeah. Kind of wasted, completely wasted. On the right there, look. That's him, yeah, I think. What? It's so weird. Yeah. He sells it though, doesn't he? He's... Oh Norton. No, I love, he's so good in those uh, Cynthia Rothrock movies as China O'Brien and Magic Crystal, oh. Lady Dragon. I used to watch Lady Dragon again. I've not seen it for years. I think it's, isn't it out on Blu-ray now? Like, didn't they do like a new version of it? I think my, I'm sure my friend bought it. <laughs> Ninja Walk. <laughs> he does it again when he leaves. He's like, why are you doing that? You know, what I mean? he's like. He's like just kneeling down and sort of shuffling along, you know. Oh, here we go. The ninja magic stuff, you know. What 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 happened there? First of all, wasn't that a door on the other side rather than a? Set? Yeah. Oh, and that was, oh, what? So he used a <gasps> firework to. Oh, I, don't know. I think he opened it. Then he threw the firework down. The little, you know, smoke cloud, and then. I don't know. So the firework it must have unlocked something. Probably not important. <laughs> oh, I love it. What should it? One one's out. You see one down the corridor, I think. <laughs> what did he need to do? What did he need to do that? Straight, straight to the world's most conveniently located ladder. <laughs> it is, yeah. Right, let's just leave a ladder up against the wall of a prison 
next to the fence. <laughs> Oh my god. All this hardware really adds value to this movie as well. If you know, I've always been impressed by just how many trucks you see trundling about and Yeah, those tanks are massive, aren't they? Yeah. Wow. But a lot of these movies try to take place on an army base and it's just the same two jeeps you see all the time and but there's loads of proper hardware. This is great stuff. This is as good as as good as it gets. Yeah, Dudikoff is really selling it here. I think because he's got you know he's got a, he's up against the skilled martial arts. He's got to you know make a proper effort here. And also Yamashi, uh, a part of the deal. I think it's the same in wrestling. I think part of the deal in a in a filmed fight is the work the expert does himself. I mean, yeah. Tadashi yeah. Yamashita can do things to make Dudikoff look good. Just as Richard Norton was doing a minute ago, actually. See, even with the editing, then they're letting you see the impacts as well. It's not like as we saw, kind of later on, where American action movies would often cut too quickly, or they won't show you the impact. They'll cut before it impacts, so you're actually seeing things edited properly here. And it's come from enough angles as well. So Sam, yes, it's Sam Furstenberg, who never didn't know how to do action before doing uh, Revenge of the Ninja, you know, really sort of learned a lot, didn't he? And it, by this point, he's he's totally he's totally competent at what he's doing. I think he's a natural. I also think Revenge of the Ninja is a far better film than Enter the Ninja, the first one. Mm. I know, I know, you're not quite so convinced, but but my friend, I had not seen, I've seen bits of it. And my friend. Um, Stuart was like, oh, it's awful. I was like, what? I'm supposed to be better. I, I, you know, word of mouth said it's better. <laughs> it's definitely more authentic. The fight scenes are definitely better. And it doesn't have that awful blamange of a subplot with the relationship <laughs> with sad. Susan George. and the Awful. Oh, it's just... Does it, doesn't, like, the main hero, he cheats on his, like, mates. Cheats on his mate. He, like, he thinks of his wife. Yeah, within like, hours of arriving. It's kind of, it feels like morally bankrupt here. Yeah. <laughs> Dudikoff should have been Guile in Street Fighter the movie. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I mean, it would have been perfect. It would have been perfect. You know what I mean? Just make his hair like completely just like sticking up like like a big brush. You know, it would have been great. And he, most people probably would have, would have understood him more than that. <laughs> you know, he was like forgetting his lines throughout the entire film. What's she doing here? I'm really annoying. Of course I'm here. <laughs> we, need, we need annoying psychic. Because she, she had just... Um, she had shot... I think around the same time, Weird Science, but that film hadn't come out yet. But um, so she was already on a kind of roll quite quickly yeah. with her career, you know. But I think I don't think I don't think she acts anymore. I think she does. Doesn't she do something else now? I think she's changed her career. That might not have been a bad decision. <laughs> ah! She's not the strongest link, is she? I mean, she does a. She does a perfectly good. I'm not. I'm no, not. She runs a Pilates thing. Makes oh, of course, thing. yeah, that would make yeah, sense. That's, <laughs> that's why she hasn't aged. <laughs> <laughs> that's a <like> chip Pilates. <laughs> she's perfectly serviceable, but she's not. She's not a highlight. She's not an acting highlight. No, is she? no, she's not. Like she's just a bit of an airhead sort of approach, isn't it? You know. So watching it again, actually, John Lamotta, the the asshole sergeant. Is yeah. he really stood out for me? He was a lot of fun, cartoon villain. Oh, definitely. Because he's like, you know, he's obviously selling arms to the uh, rebels, isn't he? So it's all kind of what is, you know, back end sort of colluding. Yeah. Make a bit of money. God, but I bet a lot of that went on. <laughs> Well, 
Steve James. They've got a T-shirt on Steve James. What's he doing? <laughs> he must have been asleep when it happened. <laughs> Wait a minute, in my contract, I've got to be topless throughout this movie. Why am I wearing a shirt? <laughs> it must be cold, Steve. No, I don't get cold. <laughs> I think it, it was in... in a, either a docu- the documentary I saw on YouTube on this or somewhere something someone was telling a story about Steve James saying that yeah, someone actually said to him well, why why do you never wear a shirt and he, he said something like man I, I put all this effort into looking this good I want everyone to see <laughs> amazing He's got no evidence of that. Yeah. Say, this is—it's one of those just tell Dumbledore moments. Just, yeah. just you know that this is bullshit. Say it so that she knows, because she'll believe they you. They always do it in movies, you know. It's like when someone says, "Oh, I saw something," and they don't, and you clearly can easily describe it to the other person. I saw this thing, I just unexplained. I'm like, just tell them what you saw. It's like, so just really, you know, oh, it drives me up the wall. Me too, it's such a naff plot device. It is. <laughs> or, yeah, or it's, it's, I, 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 I call it Just Tell Dumbledore because it was back in, I remember watching Harry Potter movies with friends and just every <laughs> single one of those films can doesn't have to happen if someone just tells Dumbledore in the first scene. They're <laughs> insanely short films. They're these short films, basically. You know, that'll be it. The end. <laughs> that's a great shot. I, mean, that's, I don't know if... Oh, no, no, no. But Rob, but Rob, coming up is a comical mode. It is gold, right? Okay, so when the guy's chasing him, the car goes down the hill, comes to oh, a yeah, slow sort of standstill, yes. and explodes. <laughs> it's like a gag in The Simpsons, you know, with uh, Hans Molman, his car just like... Comes to That's exactly what I thought when I yeah last time I saw was that mole man bit in The Simpsons, <laughs> and just to add insult to injury, it's followed by a fantastic shot of um, of Dudikoff looking back at what's happened or some so, there's some kind of reaction shot of Dudikoff that I wish they mm. held longer. Oh man, we'll see shortly. I love these bits though, movies where they've got like the stunt guys driving the vehicles. They cut to a close up, they go like five miles an hour. Yeah. And it cuts back to like, here we go! <laughs> oh, oh no! And suddenly. Bam! <laughs> oh, that's great! I'll teach you to have a bumper made out of nitroglycerin. <laughs> the, this, this shot here, as he pulls away, I, think it's, if, I really wish they stayed on it. So because it, yeah, it stays, so you see the carnage on the right. Yeah, you know what I mean. He's driving away from. Yeah, but it's so immediate and real feeling. It has got a bit of soft focus. I think the focus pillar wasn't doing. Yeah, right. yeah when I you say soft focus, focus, I think you mean it was out of focus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, maybe that's why they didn't hold on it longer. Actually. <laughs> Sneak, ninja sneaking <laughs> I love that <laughs> <laughs> oh my god oh look at that house it's oh it's thunderously 80s John Wayne it. on the wall as well oh picture of John framed picture of John Wayne <laughs> <laughs> what <laughs> this is like product okay the set dressing make it look American yeah <laughs> Let's put John Wayne on the wall <laughs> god it's like hats hang up on the wall, yeah. like they're collectibles or something. Oh my god, I didn't never notice that before. It looks like a Florida condo just transplanted to the Philippines. Oh mate, it does it does? See, this is, this is ninja stuff. Yeah, climbing on buildings. Looking at women through windows. Yeah. Look at that. Look at that boombox there. It's yeah, huge. I was just trying to work out what that was. It's, it's a monster. Ooh. Now apparently, like the uh, he was supposed to have this kind of robotic hand or something, or like he could switch it out and put different um, like fire stuff. But 
Um, in the film, it's just more this kind of gauntlet he's got, isn't it? That can like fire like darts or something yeah. spike will come out. I think it actually makes more sense, you know. But that um, yeah, the budget didn't stretch to do these kind of bit more elaborate things. I'm not entirely convinced by this guy either. The the uh, oh, one the standing French the, dude. No, no, the French guy is great. He's I mean, look, <laughs> just look at him. He's just got his arse in shot. <laughs> he's got a wedgie. I like the way that the French guy, being French, he's had to colour coordinate his outfit to the room he's going to be in. No, oh, definitely. They're only after like a couple of million, aren't they? I mean, I suppose at the time it was like, whoa, that's a lot of money. But nowadays you'd be like, ah, oh, you know. We've seen, you know, bad guys ask for billions, you know. Yeah. I think it doesn't, it, it almost doesn't matter, does it, though, in, in a way. It's just, it's just a number, it's just a device to drive the plot at the end of the day, especially in yeah. movies like this where that aren't exactly obsessed with their plots. I mean, they, they service them, but they're not, they're not going to spend too much time worrying about the plot. It's just, all they, all, there just needs to be a motivation for everyone, doesn't there, really? Mm-hmm. Which is fortunate, given that we know the, the plots to the sequels make absolutely no sense whatsoever. Ugh. Number two is like the building blocks for like Universal Soldier, but with ninjas. Yeah. You know, that's all it kind of is. Yeah. It's weird. Like the main villain of it is like you wrote the script. It's like, oh. It's like, okay. <laughs> yes, yeah, he did, didn't he? Yeah. Because he was like, oh, I was interested in ninjas and was going to do an American Ninja before the film was even made. I was like, okay. <laughs> I believe you. <laughs> I want to say there's um, some sort of connection between Universal Soldier and... Yes, Michael Duthie, the editor of American Ninja 2, also uh, edited Universal Soldier. My God. That's just a coincidence, isn't it? I can't, I can't, there's no causal link there. He, did, he didn't influence Roland uh, Emmerich, did he? <laughs> and uh, Dean Devlin? You gotta, you gotta make these super soldiers. He went on to um, to a bunch though. The, the editor of, well, I think this has got a few editors credited, hasn't it? But the, I know uh, uh, Michael Duthie was like one of the golden child chosen ones at Canon for a while, and he edited this and American Ninja Two, and then he's gone on to work like a lot of old Canon people has gone on to work for Millennium and New Image so he's mm. he's he edited um I think he did the has, has Fallen series and I know he's done the oh, new why? Expendables it's a number four is he I've not seen that yet no um, I haven't yet but just day, I've just dated the commentary there um <laughs> so yeah so I've got a feeling everyone will have forgotten about Expendables 4 in a few months there's really no there's no hype for it no at all it's like it's really weird I don't know, no money spent on marketing. I'm not it's sure who that. they're making those films for anymore because it looks like a Jason mm. Statham vehicle for, based yeah, on the trailer. Pretty much and is. That's pretty much not is. what the original concept was. Nope. I've got nothing against Jason Statham vehicles, I should say. <laughs> he just needs to be surrounded by loads of 80s action stars. That's what we're paying for. <laughs> he's in a, a whole bunch of um, he's good uh, Sam Furstenberg movies too yeah, yeah. He's, he's a good actor yeah he specialised in this character as well because there's at least um, oh god I made a note of it and I forgot to I forgot to bring the note with me but he's played this exact character in at least one other movie uh, a Japanese uh, soldier Left behind on an island in World War Two, and then yes, what was that? <laughs> it's a, it's a well known one. It's a it's a familiar performance, mm. but I can't remember it now. I was just going to say this is a, this is this is where this plot also suddenly makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. <laughs> because they've got, they've got to justify his ninja skill. Back yeah, there. yeah, they've 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 got this whole backstory that they need to explain away. Which is, if you missed it at the beginning, he's um, Michael Dudikoff's Joe character has lost his memory. He's got complete amnesia. 
So his life story is, he's on a plane as a small boy, the plane crashes, and he's the only survivor. He's found by this guy, and raised by this guy, and taught to be a ninja, and then there's a, a random explosion and they're separated for some reason. I'm not sure we're ever told why. And then he's... Michael Dudikoff then becomes Michael Dudikoff's character. But in this flashback, when they show it, he's still played by the same actor when they get separated, the same child actor. Mm. So his entire experience of his ninja training must have taken place, you know, over a, a period of only months because, you know, he's played by the same young boy. Yeah. And the, I, I don't understand why they're then separated. I don't understand how they're then com completely coincidentally brought back together here. And also in the sequel, there's there's flashbacks to, them, to him training yes. Michael Dudikoff. So how is really? yeah? So Michael uh, like in the jungle uh, as a mm. child, but you know not as a child as a as a supposedly young. So none of that makes any sense at all. Because yeah, I used to stock footage on this one to show like the sort of Jedi kind of like flashbacky moment he has. Like in number two, where he's in that school, isn't he, for the end battle? Yeah, he's on the he's on the stairs. He just stops for a moment and starts meditating. But um, I, I, yeah, I think it was. Mm, I suppose his his teacher was obviously working for the bad guys as a sort of gardener. So that kind of it's just a coincidental they sort of bump into each other. But yeah, it's kind of a bit late into the game to sort of say, "Oh, here's your backstory." You know what I mean? Well, yeah, but, that's that's a Sam Furstenberg special. Which is um, which actually, I don't, I don't, I kind of, I kind of like it to be honest. I, I think it can work either way. But he, he liked Sam Furstenberg. Always liked to have a not a plot twist in the final act, but a big reveal that that, that demonstrates a connection between mm. two characters. In Ninja Three, the domination you don't learn um, until the last act or near the last act that. Um, the hero ninja Shokasugi's character's wife and family were, were actually killed by the the evil ninja who he's been who he spent the movie chasing. That's a a last act reveal that kind of adds sudden weight to it. And um, yeah. I noticed um, you know, in an interview with Sam uh, that I read recently, uh, um, American Samurai was mm. taken away from him and re-edited. Um, because the studio didn't want to do that. They, they wanted to reveal in the last act that the hero and the antagonist were actually brothers and had been trained by the same sensei, very much oh. like in a um, uh, couple of Chuck Norris movies, actually. But, and they took it away and they re-edited it completely linear. And he was sort of saying he doesn't like a linear story. He likes, he likes to have a reveal in the last... And when you stop and think back about it, a lot of his films do. A lot of his films do that. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, I like that idea, though. I, think, I, th I, th I just think in terms of your issue with it, though, it wasn't, uh, I don't know, well executed. Yeah, I mean, it, it may well be that I misunderstood and we're actually flashing back in American Ninja to, to this scene here. But either way... The idea that this is that this guy was lost in the jungle, and because the implication is that it's the villain who separates them, mm. who separates the, the the sensei from the young Michael Dudikoff character when when they and give and gives Michael Dudikoff the amnesia. So it is a complete coincidence that mm. Dudikoff's travelled halfway around the world and found himself <laughs> battling the employee of the, his, his long lost surrogate father. Now that a minute ago was amazing. There's a backflip, and then gets his knife around the girl. That was great. Oh, Dudikoff in the suit. Here we go. He's basically he's, he's basically Batman now. Yeah. <laughs> he gets such a great money shot at the end as well. It is, isn't it? It's so good. God, it's so seventies. The score is God. Here we go. Like <laughs> let's do the smoke. Oh, here we go. Look. Oh, yes. it's a team up. <laughs> Double Dragon. So you, it's so obvious that it's Steve Lambert in um, in Michael Dudikoff's ninja suit here as well. He's a couple of inches taller and a bit and less stocky than Dudikoff. <laughs> he even gets some close-ups that don't really need to be him as well, and you can clearly see his eyes aren't aren't Dudikoff's. <laughs> Oh, 
There's some good edits here. I like this fight. So nicely edited, this film. Because it's really fast and dynamic, but it's also totally coherent and... Yes, coherent. Yeah, that is that is the key word. You know, you know what's going on. You're not lost with the fight. But there is a real dynamic rhythm, though, that's not, not that common in canon movies, to my mind. Hmm. Rhythm is always key, isn't it, to the fight sequence? It's essentially you're, you're editing a dance sequence, really. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. It's exactly how I see it. It's everything. Mm. Well, that boat over eggs that death. What? <laughs> I'd forgotten about that completely. <laughs> That's got smoke in it. People have been in the comments going, oh, you idiot. It's like from earlier on. Oh, my God. <laughs> yes, yes. Here we go. oh hell yes. <laughs> <laughs> here comes the eighties, you know what I mean? <laughs> the nineteen eighties are here. Run! If you didn't realise you were watching a canon movie, it should now be apparent. <laughs> 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 Alert the ninjas with a big drum. Oh, the place. Oh, I'd be good. Ninja playset. <laughs> Kick it off. This is going to be great. Oh, my God. Why did he wait for him? Just to then... Oh, I suppose because he wants to lead him through the through the playground. Exactly. <laughs> this is it. This, I love this. It's just ridiculous. <laughs> that wasn't even lab. That wasn't even... Uh, do the goth. That was the stunt double. Too scary, that part. Yeah. Yes. It's something Red, this is something Red Brown would do, isn't it? Yeah, the yes. screaming. That is done. a proper Red Brown in Robo War. <laughs> pose and everything. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, shoot the lights, get some extra points. Oh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Pointing round a tree. Oh, yeah, it's a funny little <laughs> moment. Oh, look at that pose. That's great. I'd, still, I'd rather have the spikes on my knuckles than my palm, though, I think. Oh, God, yeah. You just like, tap your leg. You're like, oh, fuck. <laughs> yeah, no, we knew this fight was coming as soon as we saw this big guy oh. earlier, I think. Oh, it's, oh man, it's the Philippines version of Bolo, isn't it? Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's a bench press him. <laughs> Pinoy Bolo. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man, I forgot about the flamethrower. Then I remember as a child as well thinking, oh, my God. Like, surely he burnt the hell out of himself doing that. <laughs> Ooh, that, was... that really, all... really looked real. That it did, didn't it? Yeah, did it in one take as well. That was good. Again, it's the actor throwing the punch knows what he's doing, and the actor taking it knows how to react. Does a quick? They've dropped. They cut a frame then, so when he hit the wall, it sort of like had a weird jolt to it. Yeah, they do that sometimes in movies, like in Blade Runner, where the replicant holds the gun at House of Ford, he knocks the gun out of his hand. No. Oh, other Deckard, sorry, points at the at the replicant. He knocks the gun. It's like a they cut. A I know the bit you looks, mean. Yeah, yeah. There's yeah, an unnatural really... fastness to it, if you know what I mean. Yeah, it works though, actually. Yeah. Oh, I don't mess with him. Oh, the lines completely changed again. <laughs> it just keeps changing. I love the, the deaths that those two guys do there. They, uh, we don't get enough of this nowadays. When when bad guys get shot nowadays, they don't fling their arms in the air nearly wildly enough. <laughs> Got to oversell it, have you? Yeah. And there's not enough wild recoil either. There's a, there's no. a movie called, um, called T-Force. And the, the guy... I've, in it, I've that, forgotten though. his name now. He's in a bunch of <laughs> B-movies, but... He's got the most elaborate recoil action. Every time he shoots his handgun, he almost his his arms do a whirlwind effect. 
Well, it's like um, in the guy in the thing where he's like, I'll kill you. And he's like, f- he's like whipping the bullets out of the gun. Yeah. He fires it. That's the one who's like, uh, I got diabetes. You know that one. Yeah. Yeah. Wilfred Brimley. Wilfred Brimley. That's in from uh, Hard Target. Yes, yeah. Look at this. Oh, he's uh, a proper, ju- that proper is a, superhero. That is a pose. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, not Tom Berenger. What are you going to do? <laughs> Poundland Berenger. <laughs> now watch for the suddenly appearing. <laughs> it's another great death. It's all a little bit like Tom Arnold then. That was quite funny when he got shot. Yes, he did. <laughs> There's no white bar on the front of this helicopter yet. Oh, there will be though. It sort of magically appears, doesn't it? That's a wild um, little stunt sequence on the helicopter coming up as well. Oh, it's nuts, isn't it? Yeah, I'm assuming it's Steve Lambert again. But there's... I don't know how high off the ground they are, but it doesn't it doesn't look very safe to me. God, it's got a laser as well. It's got yes, laser. I forgot it's got laser. <laughs> laser. Yes. That's an amazing <laughs> weapon it's just got. Just one random laser usage. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's zapped out the power now. He can't use it anymore. It's the 80s. He's used up all the batteries on that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Could have done with that earlier in the prison cell. The movie would have finished halfway through. <laughs> oh, they should have shot this. There's a bit too many close ups there with that saw battle, isn't there? Yeah. Have, should have shot it as a wide. And the, the, the Dudikoff's opening lunge just isn't. He's, he's lunging. To the left, you know, he's he's not he's not trusting Yamashita to move in time, so he lunges off to the side. Always, mm. always noticed that. Oh, that was good when it cuts him up his chin and his neck. That's great. Yeah, I mean, you can see some physical. You see a physical sign of the impact, and there's the white bar on the helicopter <laughs> suddenly. So, like, there's clearly no cable for that bit. Nope. Um, Nothing. Nothing there either. That would be shot lies. Yeah, well, that's isn't it? fine. Yeah. God, he can't shoot for shit, can he? <laughs> He's <laughs> literally there in front of you. <laughs> also, I love how... Um, oh, in- this bit yes. is so good! <laughs> Steve James, I wonder what's in that case. <laughs> Every case Steve James opens should always contain one of these. I love, what, what's that thing on the right that's sticking onto it? Is it what like is a, that? I think is it, I, I've got a feeling it's a magazine rack that I've seen in Habitat as well. <laughs> I love this. She's surprised that he's there. <laughs> <laughs> I wondered why the why the villain was hanging out the side of the helicopter shooting at nothing. <laughs> Rocket launcher that comes with a free shelf. <laughs> now I got you. Ah, that sound effect like a bolt of lightning. It's like some He-Man cartoon. And that's a that's a proper helicopter explosion as well. That's a, oh, a meaty one. All in one shot, all in one take. A real helicopter actually in the air. It looks like. <laughs> <laughs> what? That would still really hurt. <laughs> Here we go. They got that reveal shot. Dudikoff. Yes. Still with his eye makeup on from the from the mask. <laughs> hold, 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 hold it, hold it. <laughs> Larching, mo- local marching school band plays the theme to American Ninja. God, that was- <laughs> All these people are all dead, aren't they? Yeah, it's, it's like the. It's a, um, it was, I remember Sam Furstenberg said they had three units. So, you know, obviously, the third unit would capture all the location shots and the beauty shots. So, this is obviously what they would do for the finale. Yeah. It'd be so funny if you saw people who were actually dead just sort, of, just sort of got up and walked yes. away. <laughs> if you look closely, I bet it's happening somewhere. <laughs> You're all dead. Stay still. Oh, it's just what what a marvelous film! Oh, it's so much fun. Yeah, I can I can understand why it's, a lot of people love American Ninja. You know, you can you can make fun of it, but it's all done out of love, really. It's all just uh, 
it's kind of adds to the charm of it this kind of cheesy nature and kind of like somewhat kind of <laughs> bizarre ideas they throw into it but it kind of works but it, it's um, era appropriate that's the thing there's, there's, there's yes. so many different ways in which we laugh at bad movies it is mm. and most of them aren't ways in which the makers should be upset or offended by I don't, I don't think this is a product of its time and that's what defines its ironic appeal now it's got genuine sincere appeal but it's also got ironic appeal because the plot's kind of silly and it's you know it's it, it's all it's of its time it's it's inevitably dated mm. oh yeah yeah i think we'll have to do uh <laughs> so the score the guy, the bloody blow with the guy, the trumpet, is struggling again. The, um, <laughs> the, um, well, that's the number two, I think, as a commentary. Cause that, that is, cause that's batshit crazy. Yeah, I stuck it on again last night. And it's not long since I since I last watched it, and I wasn't planning to watch the whole thing again. I just wanted a reminder, and I ended up watching it all. Don't remember what I said to you the guy who's like that that colonel or something who joins. Uh, Dudikoff along the way has some of the best dialogue. He is the best <laughs> character by miles in any of these American ninja films. Wild Bill is his name is the commanding officer of the Marines on the island. Yeah, it's just everything he says is hilarious, and that's that's pure comedy as well. They would, like, I'm really yes, surprised. They, they knew what they were, they were trying to be funny. It's you know, very it broad like... comedy considering <laughs> the context. <laughs> yeah, completely. Oh, they actually released a paperback of this movie. My God, I'll try and find that. <laughs> no soundtrack release, no uh, <laughs> no Dolby stereo. Cheap ass movie. <laughs> well, everyone, that's the end of the commentary. Hope you enjoyed it. As I said, me and Rob will probably be back to do American Ninja Two, which is just as silly. As, well, it's far more silly than this film. Yeah, I think it's again. at least fifty percent sillier. <laughs> yeah. That's what you get with Canon. Fifty percent more. <laughs> Take care of yourself, folks, and goodbye for now. Cheers.